Okay, great. I'll go live now. Okay. Good luck. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Inclusive Higher Digital Education, The Way Forward. We have some technical information to start, and we're just waiting for the participants to join us before we officially start. This webinar will be recorded and will be available on ECBD's social media channels, including our YouTube. For the moment, your, your microphones are muted to ensure the quality of the session, but please do leave a comment or a welcome in the chat box. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function on the uh, toolbar. We have international and Austrian sign languages available that will be pinned to the screen. For now, our international sign language interpreters are a little late, but when they join, we'll, we'll pin them to the screen, but you should be able to already see Austrian sign language. Um, if you're having trouble viewing that, please send us a message um, so that we can make sure everything's running okay. In the meantime, we do also have closed captionings and you can um, activate that by clicking the more button and selecting uh, the show subtitles um, in the, the toolbar. And then you can move these subtitles around where you want uh, by dragging them around. Um, if you want to access the captions on a separate tab, on the internet browser, you can click the link that will be provided in the chat box. So with that, I think we can get started and I will hand over to Alison to start. Hello and welcome. My name is Alison Carmen Key and I work for the University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom. Thank you for joining us for today's digital conference on inclusive higher digital education, the way forward. This conference is part of the INCLUDE project funded by Erasmus Plus in direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. March, 2020 was an unforgettable time in global history. No matter where you work and live, you will remember how quickly we moved from rumours of a new disease to a complete lockdown with mandatory social distancing. Although some had experienced smaller scale lockdowns for diseases such as SARS, this was the first worldwide event and one for which most people were unprepared. If you were teaching in March 2020, you may remember hours or days spent learning how to deal with new software, rearranging the activities in your lesson plans so that they could be carried out online and getting used to the change from a lecture theater full of students to a monitor with rows of student screens with their cameras switched off. If you were lucky, perhaps you were used to working online already. Perhaps you had family, or colleagues with experience who could guide you. Perhaps your employer issued guidance and ran courses for you. If you were unlucky, you had none of those things and spent a lot of time on trial and error. The INCLUDE project has interviewed staff and students at universities, service providers and policy makers to identify the tips and best practice they developed through those weeks of learning under pressure. We focus not only on technical elements of the teaching experience, but also on inclusion and belonging. How we can give people a sense of community while they're working in isolation. Our project also looked at the access requirements that different people may have when attending lectures or other events. We believe that most people are happy to support access and to treat others fairly. But to do this, they may need some support to know what tools and options are available to them. By gathering information on accessibility tools and practice in one place, we hope to make it easier and quicker for lecturers and other presenters to respond 
to people's access needs. The INCLUDE project consortium is led by the University of Wolverhampton, collaborating with the University of Klagenfurt in Austria, the University REN2 in France, and the host and organizer of today's event, the European Association of Service Providers for Pe Persons with Disabilities in Belgium. I'll let my colleagues from these organizations introduce themselves in a moment, as they will each present to you the results of our project work and the practical resources we've been able to provide for higher education professionals, policymakers, and service providers. Now, for the first of those presentations, I'll hand over to my colleague from EASPD. Thank you very much. Um, so as Alison says, I am uh, Rachel, Head of Operations from the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities. We represent services that support persons with disabilities across the life cycle of um, the person, whether that be um, their first years and months, uh, also to receive an inclusive education, as well as to live independently and find employment. So we were leading um, the first work package of this project, which I will present a little bit more um, now. I'll start off with a more um, generic opening to um, what is inclusive education? Why are we talking about it? So um, an inclusive education is an, a learning environment in which all barriers that could limit the, the participation and achievement of any learner are removed. It's uh, focusing on embracing diversity and um, celebrating different ways of learning um, and showing how we've learned. It recognizes and accepts all of our unique characteristics and talents of both students and staff members. Um, and often we rely on reasonable accommodations which um, provide reasonable adjustments to help more learners be included and have their um, special education support needs um, supported. And as we said, the aim of the INCLUDE project was to provide lecturers and um, others, including students and service providers with some tools and knowledge that um, make their materials more accessible from the start so that these accommodations are less needed. Um, with the first activity, the first output of the project, um, we worked to develop an online repository that can be used by all of these stakeholders. So lecturers, higher education professionals, um, students, and also service providers um, that they could come to online and um, use these, as we've said, to make their materials more inclusive. So I'll explain a little bit more about um, how we developed this output and then give you a very short tour of the repository. And hopefully it's something that you can use going forward in your work. So um, we started with a study on the state of play of um, the level of awareness that lecturers in particular, but also higher education professionals and students had on current available accessibility tools. This study took place between October and November of last year, and uh, we had around 170 respondents complete the survey um, coming from Austria, Belgium, France, and UK, the project partner countries, but also further afield, um, including Malta and Romania. If you want to read this um, report in more detail, you can do so via um, the QR code that's on the screen now, and you can also find it online, and we'll share the link with you afterwards. So some key findings that we had um, from this survey is that less than half of people were already using digital, access digital accessibility tools for their online work. So of those surveyed, only 40%. Um, but we did find more positively that those who were using digital tools already, um, they, they were doing so thing with accessibility in mind, thinking about how they can make their resources um, more useful and more easily used by a larger amount of people. Um, over half of the respondents 
so that they didn't use digital tools because they didn't know enough about them. So it showed for us there was a, a clear need for this project um, for the training material or the, the guidelines that we were um, creating and also um, the repository that we wanted to develop. Um, we also saw that informal training and prior personal use were a key way in which respondents knew how to use accessibility tools. So suggesting maybe that sometimes there was a bit of a, a lack of training um, by the, the education provider or, or the employer, um, often a university. Um, and many people weren't able to, to use, be able to find these tools and again, not know how to use them. So we saw, thankfully for us, uh, we saw that there was a clear need for this project and um, that hopefully moving forward, the materials that we developed would, would be of use to those people who we surveyed. So um, from this survey, we moved on to develop the Include Online Repository of Digital Tools. Again, you can access it via the QR code. So this is a platform of existing and um, often freely available digital tools that can be used to support both inclusive and accessible education for all learners in online digital settings. Um, the, the platform is available in English, French, and German, and we've gathered together 80 over 80 tools, and hopefully that will grow. So we hope that with the tools on this platform, users can, as we said, um, produce content in more accessible formats, maybe thinking about how they can develop a PDF that um, has better tagging for people who use screen readers um, or something that uh, enables them to deliver an online class to those who maybe have um, poor internet access um, to be able to better meet the special education needs of learners, but also from the other end, be empowered to access learning materials more independently. So for example, um, uh, having a, a magnifier, an online magnifier that can um, help people to read smaller text or um, something that provides automatic captioning so that those with um, who, who are deaf or um, partial to have partial hearing are able to, to follow along their lectures more easily. So I'm just now going to show you very briefly the online platform. I'll reshare my screen. Um, so this is it. You can find it on uh, www.includeonline.eu. As you can see, it's available in English, French, and German. Um, we hope it's uh, fairly easy to move around. You can find out more about the platform, who it's for, and then um, you can come to the repository where you can search via a number of different functions. So you can either have a look through the entire repository as you want, or you can decide that, oh, sorry. Um, I am um, looking for something for my student who um, is dyslexic, and maybe you have um, a specific thing that you're looking for. Maybe you want to have something that provides you with uh, graphic resources or guidelines on how to make um, something more accessible. You can find something that's free or paid um, or in a specific language. And then the tool will automatically provide you with some, um, some tools that will be helpful for you. Um, so that's it very simply. We are aware that at the moment, this isn't a definitive list of, of accessibility tools out there. And a lot of you are probably using different tools in, in your work, so it's growing. And we invite you to check out the repository. Um, and if you think there's something missing, you can submit um, something to the repository and to help it grow and to be um, more useful for a greater number of people. So um, that's the first sort of output of this project. And um, I move on to Alexandra to um, present the next step. So thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. I will now share my screen to present the intellectual output number two. Which you should see now. And 
So, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, welcome to the presentation of Intellectual Output 2 about the technical aspects of digital higher education under the lead of Universität Klagenfurt. To present the project team, it consisted of Marlene Hilzensauer, head of the Center for Sign Language and Deaf Communication at Klagenfurt, and our project lead. Then Flavio Angeloni, who is now joining as non-presenting team member, as project support for programming and evaluating the survey, and myself, administrative support at the Center for Sign Language and Project Support for the Project Include. My name is Alexandra Pecher, and I will tell you about who were the target groups for our research, what were the thoughts behind designing the questionnaire, and of course, a quick look into the results of our survey. For the key findings, of our survey and the focus group interviews, as well as the technical guidelines for inclusive digital teaching and presenting. Those will be presented to you by Marlene Hilzensauer. As to our target groups, we looked at lecturers and students with and without needs for accommodation for blind vision impaired and deaf hearing impaired people for dyslexic and neurodivergent people, for people with a lack of fine or motor skills in general, and of course, people with cognitive processing difficulties. Furthermore, we asked for feedback from higher education professionals, which is the group of supportive but not teaching staff at universities, social service providers in the field of education, and policymakers. When designing the survey in the three languages, English, German, and French, we branched the total number of 93 possible questions into three surveys, one for lecturers, which was the most comprehensive, one for students, and a third version for presenters. So we wanted to collect the different perspectives on the topic of digital education. Which questions did we ask? We asked for general information, which group the respondents belonged to and where they lived. Then for details on technical challenges occurred with hard and software, about where they got training and support therefore. Next was the technical approach for accessibility challenges experienced during the switch to online teaching or presenting. Here we asked which accommodation they needed or catered for, which tools like screen readers, subtitling, etc., they used, and again, who offered suitable training and support for this. The final part of our survey was to find out about best practices if there was an exchange with others and whether they were willing to share some information with us or in the survey or during interviews. Let's have a quick look into the results collected and evaluated in spring 2022 concerning the experiences during this forced switch to online teaching or presenting by the COVID-19 restrictions. In total, we had 406 people participating in our survey, mainly from France and Austria, followed by UK and other countries like Germany, Italy, Belgium, and we even got single responses from Iceland, Cyprus, and Romania. Who answered our survey, which you can see as the groups listed in the in this line. In France, we had mainly students responding. In Austria, we received responses from all target groups. And in the UK, we had feedback from lecturers and AGPs, higher education professionals mainly. So which technical problems had to be faced during the switch to online teaching? Therefore, we prepared two figures. The left figure showing uh, 
the perspective of lecturers and presenters, and the right figure covering the student's point of view. And as you can see, the weighting is different. Lecturers or presenters mainly suffered from problems caused by the conferencing software, the internet connection, then next was audio, and technical problems linked to special accommodation. Whereas students, they were mostly troubled by the internet connection, by audio and video quality, and the conferencing software. I will now give the presentation to be continued by Marlene Hilsensauer. Thank you, Alexandra. Hello, my name is Marlene, and I'm going to tell you about our key findings and our technical guidelines. So, as we all know, the sudden switch to online teaching during the COVID pandemic came completely unexpected. And so both lecturers and students lack the respective experience. What we heard again and again was that for most people, online teaching had mainly consisted of uploading learning materials to Moodle or similar platforms. This meant that people didn't have any fixed solutions, but they had to improvise at first. So everybody used what they knew best. For instance, conferencing tools, which they had already used in other contexts. One of our interviewees called it a self-organizing chaos, which is an excellent description of the first days after the switch to online teaching. Later on, the universities made individual choices about what to use, and naturally, each video conferencing tool and other tools came with its own advantages and disadvantages. Of course, some universities had already worked towards uh, future e-learning, and these had a clear advantage because they were better prepared for online teaching. What people also realized was that online teaching wasn't just about doing what they had done in a lecture hall, but simply in front of a camera. You couldn't uh, show a few PowerPoint slides and talk for hours because the students would lose their focus and their concentration. So the lecturers had to adapt their whole teaching style to be even more interactive. But this is a topic that you are going to hear more about later on in connection with the third work package. What we found out was that although we have moved back to presence courses in the meantime, online teaching is probably going to stay and everybody agreed on that. At least to some extent, online teaching has come to stay. With hybrid teaching, there still seem to be some problems and the technology will have to be simplified. What lecturers wished for was some solution with a simple push of the button. Then there's one very important finding. Uh, what we learned was that with regard to accessibility, there is no simple one size fits all solution. It would be very nice, but it doesn't work this way. There are some general measures from which most people will profit, but in the end, every person is different. So they need different accommodations and these need to be tailored to the individual. So then let's have a look at the pros and cons of online teaching gathered by the responses from our interviews, focus groups and surveys. 
Uh, most people agreed that online teaching can help with accessibility. Some things work even better online. Usually the sound quality is better than in a lecture hall with many students. You can use screen readers or screen magnifiers to enlarge contents on your monitor. And you also can use your keyboard instead of a mouse, to name just a few. Then uh, online teaching also offers flexibility with regard to time schedules and location. This was something that everybody regarded as positive. It's much more flexible because you do not need to be in a certain place at a certain time. You just need a good internet connection wherever you are. And if the online teaching is recorded, then you can access it whenever you want and also several times, for instance, to brush up before an exam. What our uh, interviewees also agreed was that if you don't have to commute to the university, this saves a lot of time, usually also money and maybe even CO2. What was seen as negative was the demand on technical equipment and internet connection. If you want to use online teaching, you need the respective equipment and you need a good internet connection. And this is something not everybody had at the beginning. What was seen as very critical was the massive reduction of personal and social exchange caused by online teaching. You know, all these little encounters in the corridor or while you're having a coffee, something like that. So people really missed that personal contact. And also this advantage uh, of more flexibility and uh, more time had a negative consequence as well, because what many people reported was that they tended to keep tighter schedules online because they didn't need to factor in the time to move to another location. So it often happened that somebody left the video conference to join the next one immediately. And often they were online for hours, which was very stressful. Yeah, then let's move on to the next topic, our technical guidelines. We are just putting the finishing touches on those. What can you expect uh, when you look at our technical guidelines? They are the result of what we learned from the survey and the interviews and focus groups. And they were supplemented by an internet search for relevant materials. And everything we learned, we put into these guidelines. There's also a quick start guide at the beginning. If you are interested only in some topics, where to start and which chapters to read. Uh, for instance, the chapter inclusion and accessibility in higher education. This is where we give some general explanations about inclusion and accessibility in higher education. Then the chapter switch to digital education. This gives a summary of the information gleaned from the survey, the interviews and the focus groups. Then the next two chapters, target group students with disabilities and or chronic somatic illnesses and accommodation for digital education, focusing on our target groups. Here you will find some general information about students with disabilities or chronic illnesses. We have some recommendations for accessibility and we also have tips for lecturers in connection with the various target groups. For instance, 
if you have blind people or deaf people in your lectures, what can you do to accommodate them? The chapter Basic Principles for Digital Accessibility gives some basic information about accessibility and deals with topics like the four criteria for accessible websites or the seven principles of universal design. Then the chapter technical accessibility. This deals with connectivity, live streams. It gives some tips on accessibility during video conferences. For instance, if you're having sign language interpreters like today and also some other information. And then we have the chapter accessible documents. This is where you will find uh, some tips and advice on how to make documents accessible, some of them general. Um, and these measures are some that all people will profit from. And others refer to frequently used programs and formats like Word, PDF, and PowerPoint. And then we have the annexes. This is where you will find more information about the survey and the interviews and the focus groups. Yes, thank you for your attention. This is the most important information about the second work package. And I will now hand over to Gwen Ael for the third one. You are mute, I think. When well, can you hear us? Oh, I think we may have lost when well for the moment. Okay, in which case potentially um I can present her slides and then if she joins, Dimitri, if you can let me know, I can, um, she can take over. So our final work package uh, focused on inclusive considerations. So while the second work package looked at sort of technical guidelines for accessibility, the third work package focused on um, more how we can be more inclusive to not only persons with disabilities, but those coming from different cultures or backgrounds. And this was developed by the University of Rennes. Uh, uh, um, the structure followed a very, very similar structure to um, our, first, our second um, work package. They mirrored each other. So we had a number of surveys and then also focus group interviews to collect key findings about the experiences of students and lecturers um, and service providers during the pandemic. And then from this, um, we've developed um, some guidelines that can help lecturers to be more inclusive in their online teaching and presenting. So uh, we had some key target groups and um, they've been consistent across the project. So lecturers and students, higher education professionals, and also social service providers in the um, in the uh, field of education and policymakers. I think, Gwenwell, if you're back, if you want to take over. It's fine. I think it's sorry for that. I've got internet okay. problems. <laughs> um, so yes, as Rachel was saying, so we had two surveys, one for the lecturer and one for the student. Uh, those two surveys were available in English, German, and French. Uh, and we had about uh, 39 questions with all options. 
um, the themes uh, of the questions. So uh, the main themes were concentration, tiredness, and distractions. Uh, we also had social contact and isolation for the student and the lecturer as well. Um, the workspace and working environments in which they were, uh, we had to make sure that it was okay for them um, to, to, to teach or learn. And then we had online classes with all problems of interactions, uh, being comfortable in front of a camera or talking to a microphone. Um, we had the question of class length and breaks as well uh, from the, the work pace. And then we had barriers to learning about uh, was it okay for timetables? Did you have commitment? Is it okay financially speaking? So those were the question we had in the survey. About the survey, so both of the numbers of people responded to it. Uh, so we had 21 students from Austria responded, uh, two who needed accommodation, and we had 40 lecturers uh, from Austria as well. For the French part, so we had 92 students responding to the surveys, uh, in which there were student needing accommodation, there were 40 students. Uh, then we had one lecturer from England and uh, one student as well from England and two other students from um, uh, Romania and Colombia as well, so international students replying. Now about the focus group interviews. So we had two guidelines for the question, one guidelines who were for uh, lecturers and another one for the students. Um, so for the response, we had uh, the interview is there were 16 uh, lecturers, so two lecturers from Austria, four from England, two from France and six from Belgium. And we had 10 students replying to the interviews. There were first student from Austria, two from England, four from France, and one from Belgium. And we also have one professor and leader of a research and study skills program for postgraduate student from England, and one high education professional from England as well. So we're, let, we're a lot of people entering uh, for the interviews. So basically, the key finding we found uh, in the result of the focus group interviews and uh, the survey. Um, so we have to say that the most important thing is the move to online teaching was made for teacher and student uh, with mostly no experience at all before. So it was very complicated for them to adapt for, um, to online teaching and learning, especially for the didactic uh, online, which is nothing like face-to-face -face teaching and face-to-face -face learning. Uh, so didactics had to be adapted uh, online. The main problem were mostly interaction and exchanges for um, with students and with teachers. We also managed to see that um, the length of classes and the frequency of breaks should be reviewed because sometimes classes were too long, it was too much uh, work and it was too exhausting. So teachers and, lecturer, and uh, students were very tired at the end of the lesson. Then the online courses should be a long-term solution for some student and teacher, depending on the course and depending on the year of studies. For example, we think that the first year of studies, we shouldn't have online classes because students are not um, able to follow uh, the rules of university. They don't know how, to, how it works. They don't know how to learn. Um, they're, well, well, you have to have this autonomy that you don't necessarily have in the first year of university. And then something which is important as well is the hybrid courses should be avoided because it's too hard for the lecturer to be able to manage the face-to-face -face classes and the online classes at the same time. So there should be two people doing it at the same time or this should be um, no hybrid classes at all, or one, one week online and one week face-to-face, -face, or something that can be managed 
but it should be avoided. The pros and cons that we noted from the surveys and the interviews as well. Uh, so for the things that worked, there were this work pace and time and management, which was pretty good for the student because they could do, uh, they, they could study and, and, and have online classes at the same time. So that was very easy for them to manage their time. Uh, something that was very important as well is that it's more quiet, there's less chatters uh, during the class, so it's easier to follow the class. And then it's easier for interveners and participants to come. For example, if you have um, a conference from uh, in Austria, but you have a teacher professor from France coming, well, it's easier to manage online, but to have to, to book tickets to come and to manage your time and everything. But for the cons and the things that were negative uh, for in online classes, so there were a lot of demotivation from the student and, um, and the lecturer as well. Um, because there were a lot of distractions and not a lot of interaction. Uh, so, but the lack of interaction in class, that was the main theme um, noted during uh, the results. Then there were a lot of lack of interaction, social contacts and uh, a lot of isolation for the students, for example. They felt, uh, they felt uh, lost and alone. Um, there were a lot of lot uh, of workload as well. Uh, the student felt that they had to do a lot of exercises or a lot of work that they shouldn't have done um, if it was face-to-face -face classes. Then the workspace were not adapted um, for the students and for the lecturer as well. There were a lot of tiredness. They're, they're very, um, very, very tired at the end of the classes and the courses. So length of the classes should be managed and should be adapted. And, there, and then the last thing for the lecture, uh, they needed a lot of organization and didactic adaptation. So it was hard for them uh, to have online classes as well. So for the didactical uh, guidelines that we made for inclusive online education, so those are uh, the main um, subject we're going to talk about in um, those guidelines. So there is a short presentation about the inclusive, um, well, the project include. Then we have a presentation of the guidelines. So what is the aim of the guideline? Uh, what does, who are the protagonists of uh, the guidelines? So who helped us? Um, do the guidelines, so those are teachers and lecturer, uh, the teacher, lecturer, and uh, students, of course. Then we have um, a part about inclusion and accessibility in higher education, and then a switch to education, digital education due to the pandemic lockdown. So that was the, the main um, uh, subject and main study. Uh, and then we have uh, the solution for inclusive and accessibility courses for all. So those are the really guidelines that we, we are writing down. So first we have taking into account the needs of students. Uh, we have uh, review the length and organization of the course. Then we have interaction, cameras, microphone and live chat that had to be adapted and um, done well see between student and um, lecturers. Then we have a presentation and organization of a course, how to do it clearly and have to be explicit. Then we have recommendation for tutorials as well as recommendation for online exams. And then recommendation for lecturers to be able to manage their time and to be able to manage their emails as well, because they receive a lot of emails from students. So those are some recommendations that we can make to them. And then the annexes with um, all the surveys uh, results and all the interviews results. Um, and then the question we had uh, for the surveys and the interviews as well. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention and sorry again for the connection. Thank you very much. Maybe a, 
very practical example of some of the challenges that we faced in, in COVID-19 and in online teaching with the loss of connection. So as you've already said, um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, facilitated a very quick transition towards digital education, including for universities. And since we've moved back to normality, the demand for in online education, online teaching has often remained. Um, so hence with the, the INCLUDE project, we've been looking to develop these materials and guidelines to support universities and lecturers in, the, in this process. While in COVID, quite often it was um, a very ad hoc process and um, lecturers were often left to sort of uh, figure it out for themselves. Now, now more and more universities are looking to develop clearer strategies and processes towards this online teaching um, support its students and its lecturers. Um, so alongside these materials, um, it, the INCLUDE project has also been developing some policy recommendations that can be, um, that will be provided to national and EU policymakers, also universities, lecturers um, and service providers to um, encourage the, the move towards more accessible um, and inclusive online education. And so now for the next hour, um, we are wanting to talk to some people who have um, more of a connection and an experience of online teaching and also play a role in the policy making process to um, learn more of their experiences and um, hear their thoughts on what more needs to be done um, for the way forward for um, accessible online education. So I'd like to invite back uh, Gwenwell, who is a student at the University of Rheem, um, Andreas Jatta, who is um, responsible for the library accessibility services at the University of Klagenfurt, Sven Hustlen, uh, Steen, sorry, from the European Commission, from DG AEC and works on higher education. And also Therese Zhang, who is, um, works in higher education policy at the European University Association. So thank you very much um, all for joining us. I maybe wanted to start if with a student perspective, going well, if you're still here. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, if you could maybe share with us um, why do you think it's important that digital education is, is inclusive? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I think first the word digital means it affects everyone. So it's available for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, then the inclusive course, um, well, I think it allows you to say, ah, oh, we took into account what I had to say and they made the effort to make everyone, um, well, to take everyone into account. So I think people want to identify themselves, not feel rejected, are not concerned by the courses. So it's complicated to learn uh, something that you, you don't feel involved in. So I think that's why it has to be um, inclusive. And there shouldn't be a gap in knowledge, like education is open to everyone. Uh, so it must be accessible for everyone by taking into account the differences of each other's. And, and so, yeah, I think it, it has to, take people seriously and to help them get the right education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for you, um, how is digital learning now being used by your university post pandemic? I have to say in University of Rennes, so the courses are now less and less remote. Um, well, actually lecturers prefer that courses come back to the classroom as much as possible. Um, however, in some master's courses, I know that some professors offer hybrid courses, mm -hmm. uh, but it is still very exceptional because it's very complicated for them to manage a face-to-face -face and mm -hmm. online courses at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that some professors in some uh, courses, they maintain distance learning courses, but mm -hmm. especially when it's late hours, like for example, from 6 to 8 p.m. sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. it's easier for the student to participate. So, so we're doing it online. And, and conferences and seminars are mostly online as well because it's very mm -hmm. simple for them. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And just an extra question, how do you feel about online teaching Is it, or online learning? Does it work for you? Do you prefer um, in-person learning? What do you think about it? Well, um, in my opinion, I preferred online classes because uh, the time management was pretty easy and it was, it was, yeah, it was uh, better for me. Uh, as in master courses, we don't have a lot of classes, so it was easier for us. We just have to write, um, uh, we call it like um, a memoir, which is um, a, a master thesis. Uh, so it's easier for, for us to, to manage our time. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's like, it can be hard for some people. Um, I know that some, uh, some of my uh, colleagues, for example, they didn't have a good access, internet access, or they didn't have uh, the right equipment, so it was very hard for them to, to, to have online classes and to follow them. Uh, so maybe the university should lend some computers or make room available for online classes, that should be a better idea. Um, there, are, there was also the question, have, having the camera on. I know for myself, I don't like the camera, but I know that it was it was a good thing to do because it managed um, my concentration. So it was a good thing to have the camera on, but I know that some people hate it and they're not feeling comfortable in front of it. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to do about it as well. And um, one, one last thing is all professors don't have, um, well, they don't know all technical materials and they don't know how to manage uh, technical materials. So I think there should be trainings for them mm -hmm. uh, to be able to use the software co um, uh, yeah, correctly or to have, well, to learn how to, to manage new, uh, new softwares, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so that should be a good idea. And, also, there should be training for the didactical part. Um, so to be able to have an interactive course and to, to be able to have connection with the students and to have uh, contacts with them as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Andreas, I'll bring you in now, if that's okay, with the experience of the teacher. I know you have lots of different hats at the University of Klagenfurt. Um, but so maybe you can start by telling us about your experience of teaching during COVID-19. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, my experience were that uh, I was better prepared than others. Uh, I think I handled it quite well uh, from my personal experience. Um, this, the, one of the reasons may be that I'm a computer scientist and uh, media and communication scientist, and those both combine very well in uh, the idea of um, yeah media. And uh, because I'm personally uh, visually impaired and uh, have a heart of hearing too, uh, this. Uh, gets my focus in, in, in a direction that uh, came in handy too. Uh, yeah, uh, some of the other colleagues, uh, yeah, struggled a bit more. Um, uh, they they uh, had to experience, it, as we already heard, that they need other uh, teaching methods, uh, for example, you, you, you can't just uh, sit in your classroom and talk for hours. Uh, people will break away and, and uh, will, not get, uh, will not have concentration anymore. Um, I call this uh, black hole teaching because I saw it uh, on several occasions uh, where, uh, yeah, the problem is the back channel uh, is there but it isn't used quite well. So teachers are going to um, yeah, present the subjects and then they ask, so did you understand me? And nothing comes back. So you are staying in front of a black hole, telling the black hole your story and nothing comes back because it's sucked in. Okay. Um, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, thank you. Sorry? So you wanted to say something else? 
what do you have? Sorry. Um, should I ask another question, or did you have I, something else you wanted to say? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say uh, uh, a bit more, but uh, yeah, you can no, ask no. another question too. No, no, it's okay. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah of um uh, one one of the uh, problems um first there was the the, the fast switch as, as we already heard uh through the online learning and after the summer we came back to the classrooms and there was uh, uh the hybrid teaching uh uh history and yeah this is something uh i will come to back later okay mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, and for you, you said that you already had sort of a bit of an understanding and awareness of teaching online. Um, how or where did you learn this from? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not safe with res uh, research. So I didn't have a toolbox uh, yeah. like you developed, which uh, would have been for uh, quite handy for some some colleagues um yeah I, I already used the tools in front of uh, of the pandemic and yeah it's 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 most personal interest and if you don't have this mm -hmm. then it's it's harder for you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in the end how did your colleagues learn were they coming to you for advice or was there anything more structured from the university um most came to me for advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> the structuring, um, yeah, it's 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 still not that good at our university. As a, there could be much more structured information. There, uh, we have an internal wiki where they collected uh, uh, some some guidelines and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there could be much more. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the feelings of the students about online teaching right now? Mixed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, some like, especially students with disabilities really like uh, uh, online uh, teaching. Um, um, but they still want to have uh, the personal communications. There are lots of students that like to come back to the to the classrooms. Uh, but yeah, it, it's really mixed. So I think the future will be that we have a good mixture of both sides, online and offline. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you in a moment, but I'll now move to Spain at the European Commission. Um, so we know that inclusive higher education is an increasing focus of the EU. We have the European education area. There's also a, a communication on a renewed EU agenda for higher education. So could you tell us more about what the Commission is doing right now to promote inclusive higher education? Yes, hello everybody. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this webinar of great interest. I can indeed confirm that inclusive education is very much on the agenda in the EU. As stated already in the first principle under the Europe, European pillar of social rights, everyone has the right to quality and inclusive education and also equal treatment in access to education is covered in principle three of the European pillar of social rights. This is followed up with the European education area, which supports EU member states in their co collaboration to build more resilient and inclusive education and training systems. The European education area is about quality education and training for all, and inclusion is one of six dimensions. <clears throat> the Digital Education Action Plan 21-27 is a part of the European education area. It aims to support the adaptation of the national education and training system to the digital age. It proposes a set of initiatives for high quality, inclusive and accessible digital education in Europe. It is a stronger and long-term approach to digital education and training. Digital education can indeed, indeed help promote inclusion, which is the topic of this webinar. Digital technologies can constitute an asset in making learning environments, learning materials, and teaching methods inclusive, provided that digital gaps challenges, both in terms of infrastructure 
and of digital skills are addressed in parallel. Therefore, the digital action plan addresses both these two dimensions. The action plan includes different targeted actions supporting institutions at all levels and from all member states in using technologies for inclusive teaching and learning. And this includes taking into consideration all learners' needs and backgrounds. No one should be left behind. Making higher education system inclusive requires providing the right condition for students from different backgrounds to succeed. To ensure that the student body is diverse and inclusive, improved access and completion rates by disadvantaged and underrepresented groups should be targeted. To this end, national authority and also higher education institutions should develop strategies to help the access and success of disadvantaged and underrepresented students. There is a need to take a holistic look at how admission, teaching and assessment are organized, put measures in place to mentor students and provide both academic and non-academic support. Inclusion is also very central to the new European strategy for university, which, which was adopted in April this year. The strategy is a joint roadmap to achieve the European education area in higher education. This strategy is a European shared vision to support all types of higher education institutions to adapt to changing conditions and challenges also related to its inclusion. The strategy points out that disadvantaged or discriminated groups are still underrepresented among students, academic staff, and researchers. Therefore, among the concrete measures in the strategy, the Commission, in close cooperation with the stakeholders and the member states, will develop a European framework for diversity and inclusion. It should identify challenges and solutions for universities and the needed support of public authorities. In addition, in the strategy, the Commission calls on member states to encourage universities to implement institutional, institutional change through concrete measures for diversity and inclusion, inclusion, including voluntary quantified targets for inclusion. Through council recommendations and strategies like the ones I meant, mentioned and funding mechanisms, the EU plays an active role. It's however important to remind you of the role of the European Union in the field of education. Education is, primor, is a primary competence of the member states. According to the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, member states are fully responsible for the content of teaching and organization of their education systems. The role of the EU is mainly a supporting and coordinating one with, and particularly where we have a common European approach that would be an added value. The mentioned strategies are adopted by the European Council and hence the member states. Therefore, the Commission, member states and institutions should work together to achieve these joint ambitions. So as you see the strategies, and the kind of the European framework is kind of pushing also the member states and in this institution to, make, to move in the same direction. Thank you very much. Um, and as you say, um, education is clearly a competence of member states, but we're very happy to see the EU support so strongly inclusive higher education um, and inclusive education in general with a large number of initiatives to both lead the way and also sort of bring member states um, along with you. Mm. I think you particularly touched on lots of important things, looking to the digital um, action plan and both the importance of training on digital skills and also um, access to infrastructure. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about funding opportunities um, that are available for universities to be able to access funds from a, a European level to support them in, in this process of becoming more inclusive? Well, of course, funding is, of course, crucial in uh, when it comes to, to inclusive education. Well, when it comes to hardware and infrastructure, it is primar primarily the European Social Fund that invests in infrastructure through the funds devoted to each member state. 
The European Social Fund is the EU's main instrument for investing in people and supporting the implementation of the, the European pillar of social rights, which I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. In other words, the member states are central in this aspect and the needs also vary very much from one country to the other when it comes to infrastructure. However, the Erasmus program is central to the follow-up of EU policy in the field of education, but then primarily when it comes to mobility and projects. Erasmus is indeed a very relevant source for, for universities. Horizontal priority for the Erasmus 21-27 program is to be more inclusive. The Commission is committing to keep inclusion at the forefront throughout the implementation of the Erasmus program. We wish to, wish to make the higher, educa higher education opportunities more open to people from diverse backgrounds and facing different type of barriers. Inclusion is in fact one of the four main horizontal policy priorities. Last year also the Commission published an inclusion and diversity strategy for the Erasmus program. It includes definitions of barriers and how the program can support inclusion and diversity measures. measures. It also offers some guidance and resources. When it comes to student mobility as such, Erasmus Plus supports inclusion of students with fewer opportunities through financial top-ups and inclusion support and through new, more flexible mobility act activities that can contribute to more mobility from groups that have traditionally not been very mobile. These new opportunities include blended mobility, blended intensive programs, short-term mobility, etc. And staff can also be trained through e e Erasmus Plus staff training mobility on the topics of inclusion. Because these blended intensive programs can be organized both for students and staff members. When it comes to more like project support, inclusion and diversity are horizontal priority in the so-called key action two, which in the Erasmus program is partnership for cooperation among institutions and organizations. Key Action 2 offers support to projects that promote social inclusion and, and aim at improving the outreach to people with fewer opportunities, such as people with disabilities. These projects will help addressing the barriers faced by these groups in accessing the opportunities offered by the program, as well as contributing to creating inclusive environments that are responsive to the needs of the wider community. Within higher education, a specific priority in Key Action 2 is building inclusive higher education systems. Well, when I talk about this Key Action 2 uh, projects, the INCLUDE projects in itself is a very, very good example of the, high, of the highly relevant inclusion projects within the, uh, the Erasmus program that receive your, uh, support on the European level. I would also very much like to highlight another Erasmus Plus action, which is the European University Initiative that you might be aware of. These European University alliances are test beds and at the forefront of the future universities in Europe. Inclusion is a central dimension of the initiative. It is therefore very positive to see that several alliances already have a very strong inclusion agenda in their visions and in their work programs. Last week, I attended the first inclusion conference of the Charm EU Alliance, which was hosted in Budapest, on creating an inclusive university and improving access and participation in higher education. education. I believe and hope that these university alliances, the European University Alliances, will set an example and contribute to making our higher education system more inclusive in the time to come. So these are just some of the examples on how the Erasmus program is being used actively also to push the inclusion agenda, which is very, very important to, to European policy in the field of higher education. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll just add now, if any of the participants have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, that's a question for anybody. Um, so thank you very much. And I'll now move to Therese. Um, you're joining us from um, the European University Association. Could you maybe start by introducing your association and then telling us what are the key lessons that your members have learned in, in COVID-19? 
Yes, sure. Hello, Rachel. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here with you. So the European University Association is the voice of universities, as we usually say. So we're presenting over 800 universities and national rectors conferences across the European higher education area. So we're not limited to the EU, but a bit broader in, in terms of what we call the Bologna process. And um, we have what we have noted with our members in, in discussing with our members and sometimes so to gathering data from them um, relating to the, the key lessons is first that it's it can and should probably be considered as both an opportunity opener but also a magnifier for existing issues so there was already attention to digital before, and we had a survey with, with hundreds of universities that already have answered that before the, the pandemic, they already considered um, digital education in great majority, for the great majority of them, as one of those opportunities for them to widen access. So there was clearly already an inclusion agenda behind, and most of them also have already dealt in some way with digital education, although as previous speakers already uh, reminded as well, um, the experience might not have been widespread or streamlined in any way. Many teachers may have never taught in a digital way before the pandemic. Um, so there was a, this attention was already there. And I think there was already this awareness that digital in the upcoming years um, would be of crucial and strategic importance on the university's agenda. But at the same time, the pandemic has certainly also magnified really existing issues relating to precisely equity, the inclusion agenda, inclusiveness, and also all this relating to digital skills and literacy. So different levels, different uh, ways to um, to, um, to reach out um, digitally, let's say, and also to make the best use of re uh, learning resources in a digital environment. What we could also note, and that's quite interesting, um, was um, the sometimes lack of preparedness and also lack of adequacy in the alignment between pedagogical core goals, so learning outcomes that are sought for classes, for courses, and um, what I would perhaps broadly call infrastructure and learning environment. And this uh, was quite clear because first we started with emergency remote teaching, basically, as somebody said before, as the speaker said before, it was organized chaos. So anybody and everybody just did what she or he could do. Um, but then somehow it got a bit more structured with also institutions providing perhaps more guidelines for this. And now it, it would be important to draw lessons from that and also see for, for higher education institutions how those choices become strategies. So how can that be strategically done in the future? And this also entails basically thinking through what would my education offer look like at the university? How, what, is, what would be the share or how could it be online? What would be the share and what would be the right balance with blended learning? And what would we offer as hybrid learning? This is relating, this might sound that very obvious relating to digital, but the implicit choice that is also behind that um, means that universities would also need to address how to reimagine the added value of on-site learning. So what would be the other value in coming inside? What would be the complementarity perhaps to be sought with blended learning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would say another, perhaps another um, key lesson, a key lesson to keep in mind here is the um, really the focus on digital competences. So as we already said, not only um, not not all teachers have taught with digital sorry, with digital before, but it also means that not all students have learned with digital before. I'm not talking about using tools that, um, that serve in their daily life, but really using, using LMS and learning management systems and um, what the teacher might require and what, what several teachers may require in several different courses using digital. And what we have learned here is that it's not only a question of tools, it's certainly not only a question of technology, it's a question of pedagogy, it's a question of learning design. It's a question of course design. And here, together with several thematic peer groups that we have um, conducted at the UA, we can really see that universities would like to and uh, 
are kind of promoting also this idea of using more using universal design and um, thinking through basically how to how to reach a seamless alignment between course design, the intended learning outcomes, the delivery, and also the assessment. Um, assessment, by the way, was a huge challenge under COVID times, um, as many universities experience it. Um, yeah, and perhaps the last point I would like to add here in terms of lessons learned is attention to student and staff well-being. Um, this was a key issue during the pandemic, but actually it might even become a bigger issue after the pandemic. Um, because, I mean, we all we are all heard stories of dropout rates, you know, also burnout rates for staff, etc. And um, and that universities and also um, at system level, there should be perhaps also an appropriate and adequate uh, system for supporting staff and supporting teachers as well. Um, but it also comes to a, it comes down to a question of basically how to handle student cohorts and how to handle um, courses in the aftermath of the crisis. But we heard it from several universities that basically students are not really willing to return to the classroom. And uh, while teachers might be increasingly pressurized to prepare and deliver lessons in several formats, so online, but also on spot, uh, um, on site, and also hybrid, which also adds a lot of pressure and workload on them. And um, actually with the um, with the ongoing crisis situation, not relating to COVID, but more relating to the economic crisis, it may be more and more the case that students would have to um, take jobs, to students would have to um, free themselves to other moments than usual traditional um, times for, for classes. So this is this all requires also a learning design once again, that would need to accommodate it and um, take this into account in terms of well-being um, for students, but also for staff. Okay, I think I made several points here and I will leave it there um, and happy to rediscuss also several of those um, with the audience and perhaps also with the other panelists. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think it was very important also for you to highlight the importance of well-being. Um, I think, yeah, that's definitely something that we need to focus on. Considering these lessons learned, as we move on from the pandemic, uh, what can universities do more to promote diversity and inclusion? What can they be doing better? Um, well, I think the the, um, the first thing perhaps to 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 point out here, uh, Rachel, is really that um, institutions may have gained. Um, a better knowledge and perhaps also a better awareness towards the needs and towards what it means actually to be inclusive, what it actually means to take into account different um, and also um, let's say um, diversely proportioned <laughs> needs for um, for students, but also for staff, and what it actually means to make it flexible, to, to, to kind of provide for the possibility to offer flexible learning um, path and also a flexible provision for, for, for learning. Of course, um, there are some, um, the provision of some online services for prospective students, for ongoing students, and also for staff could be, could be improved. Um, but I think there is um, there is really a need for a more strategic decision and a more strategic reflection at institutional level, the level of universities, to place inclusion and equality of access also front and center of any strategy on digitally enhanced learning and teaching and ultimately making learning and teaching at university really digitally enhanced. So not only teaching with digital, but so that digital basically is, um, is another value. For, for, for the equity and equality agendas at the university, and also be informed, properly informed by awareness of social economic barriers to participation. So a successful strategy will also acknowledge that despite the benefits of the digitally enhanced learning and teaching, many students still expect um, synchronous in-person interactions to, to continue. So how to cope basically with demands that may may sound and may appear as um, 
contradictory, if not conflictual, but how to how to basically balance all these needs. And it will also enhance flexibility, enabling students to switch between in-person and online modes and to study at their own pace. I think the, the overall reflection on this really relates to the very core of what universities try to do, which is um, basically the curriculum. How should curriculum, and including assessment, um, enable this? How could um, institutions think through the question of equity across the board with equity, meaning that there could be um, multiple ways, multiple channels, multiple opportunities to achieve the same learning outcomes. So students in that regard could be offered equal chances to achieve learning outcomes required in the curriculum. Um, but it no, does not necessarily mean, it would not in an ideal world probably, not necessarily mean that the curricular experience should be the same for all and for any students. So institutions should basically strive for inclusiveness with equitable opportunities. Concretely, what could that mean? It could mean that, um, it could mean basically embracing adaptive learning, right? Um, how to adapt to diverse students, but also offer a variety and possibility of choice in engaging with material with resources, different types of media, different types of formats. You can have a requirement in terms, for example, of mastery of content and providing um, a piece of work um, done, but taking uh, offering possibility for multiple means of engagement. Uh, would you like to write a paper? Would you like to shoot a video? Would you like another type of action or expression or representation mean? But this also requires a lot of thing, a lot of work behind, of course. It means that the teachers need to be offered proper training on adaptive learning. It means that the institution needs to offer proper resources, including asynchronously to students to actually do that. And it also probably means a lot of work in terms of enabling um, uh, peer learning. So collaborative work um, between students, between students and teachers. So what, what one of our thematic groups, um, peer groups working on this at the UA also pointed out is that what could help is actually making students co-creators of this and notably co-creators of their assessment modes and marking criteria. So to make sure that this can be designated, um, this can be designed, sorry, in a format that kind of is clear, is accessible to all. Um, and also it's a way of course, to empower students to really understand the requirements of their assessment. So basically working on, on assessment literacy also for students. Um, all what I have said might not apply only to digital, but I think it also applies greatly when we, we are talking about digital education. Um, your colleague already mentioned the principles of universal design. This is really, I think this is really, there, there seems to be a consensus among at least those who are aware of the issues at stake, um, that this is uh, probably the way to further explore and to go for this. All right, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not really sure where to start with my response to that. It was a very clear, very ambitious, uh, strong vision for inclusive education, touching on lots of different points, looking at flexibility in the curriculum and assessments, very important universal design, universal design for learning, um, and looking at co-creation with students. There's a lot in there, and I'll give maybe the floor to the other speakers, Benuel, Andreas, Sven, if you have anything that you would like to respond to, to what Teresa has just said. Um, I'd just like to add, um, I think Therese made a lot of very good points. And I attended the, as I mentioned uh, previously, I attended the um, inclusion conference in the, that was organized by one of the European alliances only last week. And a very important message, message from that conference that also should be underlined is that when developing policy, which will, will have, that has to be done at the level of the nation states and also particularly at the institutional level, it is very important to include the students themselves mm -hmm. uh, that they need to be part of the project they can't just um, talk of them they have to be included in because they know the needs and they should be uh, a central partner in the whole when we develop strategies and, and, and try to find the good solutions they're absolutely vital in my opinion on this mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. good well I'm going to put you on the spot because I see you nodding and you are a uh designated student representative. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Or 
Um, no, I think I think Sven is right. Um, I think the students should have the voice and they should tell what they need. Um, I know for our example in University Rennes 2, uh, we have we have a council and students are in it and they're doing a lot of things, uh, especially with the studies and online teaching and everything. Um, so I think, yeah, I think uh, it should, well, that's what we've done with the guidelines. We actually ask the students uh, what, what were the needs and what uh, they wanted to be improved uh, as, um, as for education and online education. So I think it's basically ask the lecturers what they need and ask the student as well to, to improve everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Andreas? This is uh, potentially a lot, a lot for, for teachers here <laughs> to be thinking about, to be working on. Do you have any uh, comments from your perspective? Uh, yeah, uh, since we are talking about uh, which uh, about accessibility, for example, um, what I uh, yeah what I identify as the biggest problem in uh, the uh, in. in going forward is that the authoring tools that we use to create digital materials uh, do not allow, for example, teachers to really simply produce accessible materials. I want to give you an example. Word, for example, is not able, as a Microsoft Word, is not able to uh, produce PDF documents uh, that are um, are in the format PDF UA, which is uh, the format for accessible uh, PDF documents. Or there is no uh, workflow, for example, to produce um, accessible PDF uh, forms. There simply is no way because the big companies like Microsoft and, and uh, Adobe uh, do not pro do not provide this, um, and for me, this is one of the biggest problems uh, 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 that we are facing because um, we have EU regulations that we should produce uh, not only in the context of our universities but also in the public sector. We should produce uh, um, accessible content, but the authors can't do it because the tools do not support it and therefore um, a project like this one is uh, quite nice because uh, uh, because you uh, can uh, take a look at the tools and uh, get an overview thank you very much i don't know if there's any last reflections from anybody else um, on the panel we have um, a question in the chat about not looking just at the inclusivity of uh, universities for students, but also for potential um, lecturers and those looking to, to publish their work. Um, I think we've seen already that there's a very clear direction from the European Commission on their strategies for inclusive universities that um, this should be the way forward. And they're working with member states to try and implement that. Potentially, for example, if you're looking at the UK, that now isn't in the realm of um, the European Commission, unfortunately. Um, but it's certainly, I think you should, um, uh, potentially it's also a question of sort of um, disability um, employment and equal labor law. Um, so potentially it's a more specific question that we can't answer in this, um, this panel. But if there are no more questions, thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, for your contributions. Um, we, as the INCLUDE project, will be working to um, develop further our recommendations and we'll share them with you, um, focusing more on um, digital education. But as Teresa said, I think it's, it's very important to look at the wider perspective of inclusion in general and creating more inclusive and diverse universities. So I will now hand over to our project um, coordinator, Alison, over to you. Thank you. 
So during today's conference, we've presented the idea of an inclusive environment as one where as many barriers as possible have been removed. As Rachel showed in her presentation about the Include repository, less than half of our respondents were already using digital accessibility tools. However, more than half of those people use the tools because they wanted to provide a more accessible and inclusive experience. In the presentation about the Include technical guidelines, Alexandra highlighted specific technical problems experienced by respondents to our survey. Uh, while higher education lecturers and professionals and students both struggled with internet problems, and indeed we struggled ourselves today, conference software was a greater issue for staff, while audio was more of an issue for students. While speaking about the Include Access and Inclusion Guidelines, Gwen Ayel noted that while online courses can be a good long-term solution for some students, hybrid teaching with in-person and online students in the same session is not seen as the best option. For online teaching in the future, class lengths and break times should also be considered. The social aspect of education was mentioned in both presentations about the guidelines. Lack of social contact between staff and students and students with each other can lead to feelings of isolation and demotivation. Our access and inclusion guidelines will mention some tips found by lecturers to promote more of a connected and community feeling. So please look out for the final version of those guidelines on our website. Following the panel that we've just completed, I would like to thank our four expert panel members, Gwenael from the University Ren2, Andreas from the University of Klagenfurt, Svein from the European Commission, and Therese from the European Universities Association. Svein highlighted the European Union's commitment to inclusive education. Seeing as it is a right for all to have access to education in a format they can use. As he said, digital education can contribute to this if gaps in infrastructure and skills are addressed in parallel. Gwenael and Andreas both pointed out that some lecturers need access to further training in digital education skills. And Andreas said that the existing resources could also be structured more clearly. We hope that the outputs from the INCLUDE project presented to you today will contribute to addressing the gap in skills. Therese rightly told us that while it's common to focus on lecturers and their digital skills, there are two other important points to consider. First is that many students are also new to digital education and may also need skills support. Second, universities must think about well-being for both staff and students. Perhaps universities didn't have time to think about these issues at the start of the pandemic, but they should think about them going forward. Thinking about policy, Svein said that students must be involved when decisions are being made, whether at institutional level or national level. Gwen Ayel confirmed that we have involved students in the focus groups for the INCLUDE guidelines and have taken their recommendations into account. So after summarising the content that we've covered today, I would like to thank our interpreters for International Sign, Razak and Day, and Austrian Sign Language, Eva and Nicole, and our live captioner, Bo. They have helped us to follow our own advice and give an example of access in today's event. I would also like to thank Erasmus Plus for giving funding to help learn from COVID-19. Without their funding, the INCLUDE project would not be possible. Finally, 
I would like to thank all of you who have joined to watch today's conference and give us your input. We hope you have found it interesting and that you'll be able to use the include outputs in the future. We will end today's conference here. Thank you again.